Tim Stack. Now here's the host of the show, a man who to this day is still embarrassed by something he once said to actor George Siegel that happened 43 years ago. It's TV's Tim Stack. Yay! Big applause. Big applause for me today on this Monday in Santa Barbara. Um, Are there still things that you think about like you're still embarrassed about 50 years later or 40 years later? This is one of those stories, and I tell a lot of stories when I was a waiter, uh, and I told a story about sort of involved George Siegel last week. But anyway, so it's like 1981, and I'm a waiter at the Ginger Man in Beverly Hills, and George Siegel's jazz band plays on Sunday. And George Siegel at the time was a really big movie star. I mean, in the 70s and 80s, he had big movie fun with Dick and Jane, with Jane Fonda. The list goes on and on of George Siegel movies virginia wolf it's just he was a huge movie star he would be like on the level of talking to you know will ferrell or bradley cooper like big movie star and he had this jazz band so one day i'm in the kitchen and i'm talking to him and it's like it's kind of cool i'm talking to george siegel and we were talking and he tells me that uh i'm from bucks county pennsylvania doylestown but he tell told me he went to the George School, which was this Quaker boarding school in Lower Bucks County in Newtown, Pennsylvania. I was like, oh, my gosh, what are we we're talking about my best friend's mother had gone there. And, uh, you know, so we're talking about it. And he said, well, you know who else was in my class, don't you? And I said, no. Ooh. And he said, Blythe Danner. And I went, oh, my gosh, Blythe Danner, the actress. That's really cool. It's Gwyneth Paltrow's mother. Uh, like, uh, and then he said, and you know who else was in my class? was Keir DeLay. And I look at him and I there's a pause because I have no idea who he's talking about. But of course, I said, oh, Keir DeLay, she's fantastic. <laughs> and I see this look on his face. It's a polite, uh-huh. you're an idiot look. And I know I've said something wrong. So of course, I go home. There's no internet then, but I start asking people, Who's Keir Delay? Who's Keir Delay? Turns out Keir Delay was the other male star in 2001, A Space Odyssey with Gary Lockwood and Keir Delay. But I heard the name Keir Delay and I just assumed it was a woman. And I said, oh, she's fantastic. And he gave me that look. So I still think about that one wakes me up every once in a while. Oh, God. In the middle of the night, like, ugh, Tim, you're such an idiot. Um, and that continues to be the case. But <laughs> I have a guest today who is not an idiot. And this is going to be fun. You know, usually I have comedy writers on and, and comedians and actors. And, and this is a person who's got a fantastic sense of humor, but she works in the world of real crime. So uh, let's, we got a little uh, clip to play. Let's play the clip and then I'll introduce her. Los Angeles, once a sleepy ranch town, now home to the stars of Tinseltown, the captains of industry and over one million men, women and children, and home also to murder. The horrific slaying of Betty Short, a.k.a. the Black Dahlia, has captured the imagination of the Southland and baffled the best minds in law enforcement. Okay, Joan Renner is the person behind the scenes at DerangedLACrimes.com. She's a writer, lecturer, tour guide, social historian with an expertise in Los Angeles crime. She's been on the ID channel, Discovery Channel, such shows as Deadly Women, Evil Twins, Deadly Affairs, Evil Kin, The Nightmare Next Door. You get the idea. She says, if the show has dead or evil in the title, I've probably been interviewed for it at least once. There's that sense of humor I was talking about. Anyway, she does it all with a wink and a nod. Please welcome Joan Renner. Yeah. Thank you. Boom. Yay. Big applause. Yeah, Good more yes. Joan than me. That's right. That's it's, my true. it's my pleasure. Joan, um, we met. Uh, let me just tell quickly, people. <laughs> I, I've always loved uh, true crime. Not as much as my daughter, but but I love it. But I really love the whole which we're going to get into in this, the whole sort of post LA, post World War II LA crime world. And it's sort of its pinnacle is the Black Dahlia murder. So my wife and I went on the Black Dahlia tour, which Joan is going to explain because she's a part of all these other tours. But I will just tell you before she explains it, it's one of the best things you can do in Los Angeles. 
is take one of these tours because it's not only entertaining and informative, it's just interesting. If you're interested in LA history at all, it's really, really interesting. Anyway, Joan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, so we met on that bus tour. Tell us about the bus tour. Tell us about the Black Dahlia tour and the other tours that you're involved in. Okay, well, the Black Dahlia tour, um, it's it's funny. It started when I when I decided I wanted to do something else other than work at UCLA. Came around that I could retire, get out, do something else with my life. I met Kim Cooper and Richard Shave, and Kim had a, a blog, a true crime blog. They were, she was blogging a crime a day in 1947. And I thought, oh, this woman is a freaking genius. I really love her. And she put out a call for writers. And I thought, well, you know, nothing ventured. I thought I'd give it a try. I ended up in her spam folder. And then she finally got a hold of me. She said, are you still interested? And I said, oh, without a doubt. And so what I is it you, you, it was a crime a day? You wrote a little crime blurb? A, crime a day. We did a crime a day. 1947 out of the newspapers and it was just it was genius because 1947 you have the black dahlia you also have um bugsy siegel is murdered in june of that year so it was a wonderful year to get started with and then she started getting requests from people you know there's all these locations it's so great why don't you give a tour it's like ah oh, bus tour yes so she and her husband put together a company named it esoteric uh -huh. And away we went on a coach class bus. It's and we I can't tell you how much fun it is. And also Kim and Richard are really pure LA architectural historians. Yes. So you're yes. getting a bit of the, you know, they'll drive by a building and you'll get the history <laughs> of this building and who was there, not only just what crimes were there, but yeah. real stuff that happened in Los Angeles. And they're very much preservationists. They're yes. doing their best to save these buildings. Yes, they really are. I mean, I can drive around Los Angeles and point out crime scenes, but they can also point out why this is an architecturally significant building. That I'm not so good at. I know buildings I like, that's about it. But the bus tours are fun for me because I always learn something from the people on the tours. Um, they'll, like one time we were doing the Black Dahlia tour and uh, a woman raised her hand and we were talking about Dr. Paul DeRiver. Paul DeRiver was the LAPD shrink at the time. And he liked to interview people by making them um, remove all their clothing because he felt they would be more vulnerable that way. Oh, boy. Uh-huh. And so who's going to lie when they're naked? Um, I know I think I could pull it off, but <laughs> didn't he mostly no. And so um, that's how we interviewed people. And so this woman raises her hand and she said, would you like to know more about Paul DeRiver? Because he interviewed some of the suspects for the Dahlia case. And we said, yes. And she said, first of all, his name isn't really Paul DeRiver. It's uh, his last name is Israel. And he is not from France. He is from New Orleans. And she said, it was really a blow to my sister who went to Paris to live in order to get in touch with her French roots. And she found out that there are no French roots, but we said, well, what happened to your sister? And she said, well, she loves it. They're just going to stay. But we didn't know this. We didn't know that necessarily that he interviewed people while they were naked. We didn't know oh. that his name was actually Paul Israel. We found out all these things. And so I always learn something from the tour goers. And that's what I really like. I like, it's not just, we're not just talking heads. We get a chance to interact. People bring what they know. Uh, it's just, it's wonderful. It's a really good experience for me. It's just, I, I, again, I can't recommend these tours. I don't know what the price now is, but it's a very comfortable bus. And you end up on the Black Dahlia tour, at least you end the tour at where the body was found down in what is considered Compton, right? Isn't that? Well, it's Lamert Park. It was then, and it is still Lamert Park. And um, at the time, when the Black Dahlia was found, uh, part of it had been built up and part of part of it in one of the houses was one of um, probably one of L.A.'s first mobsters, Jack Dragna. He lived just a couple blocks away. I didn't know that. Yeah. Jack Dragna lived there. And um, where Beth Short was found was a vacant lot. But all the infrastructure was in they, the, the sidewalk was in the fire hydrant was in. That's how we know where her body was. It was 50 feet 
north of the fire hydrant. That's how you know. And But it was just a vacant lot. And that's where she was found. She was found uh, about a foot in from the uh, from the sidewalk and 50 feet north of the fire hydrant. And on a clear day, you can see the Hollywood sign just to the north, too. One, and one of the things, that, again, the tour is so historical, but but they put it in context where one of the things I found so interesting was that post-war Los Angeles, so many GIs had come through Los Angeles, either on their way to Japan or on the way home from Japan, and they think, this is paradise here, I'm going <laughs> to stay. But what what is pointed out on the tour, which really makes sense, is you know during after World War One there was you know you had you were you had battle fatigue, you know, and then there was PTSD. You know, there was all these, you know. But World War Two, it was just hey, we won. Come on home, you're good to go. We won. It's great. And so all these crazy guys who had been overseas were running around Los Angeles. And they thought that that played a part of the Black Dahlia crime. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, in fact, we just did a tour on Saturday. It's called Hotel Horrors and Main Street Vice. And one of the cases I talk about is a guy who was actually um, mustered out of the service. They kicked him out of the service because he was in for 10 years in the Navy. And they kicked him out in 1941 because they determined that he was a sexual psychopath. Uh huh. So when you are when you're thrown out of the service during wartime, that means you're not even good enough to be cannon fodder. So this is a deeply disturbed human being. Right. And he, he was a spree killer. He too he killed two women in two different downtown hotels, and it was the the you have Los Angeles is this giant stew of young people. Everybody skewed young because there were people there for the war work. There were people there, like you said, coming through uh, the service. And it wasn't like you could say to somebody, oh, you know, last bomber over Japan, turn out the lights. Or, you know, when you leave Europe, turn out the lights, the war is over. These guys came back and some of them uh, reentered civilian life and they were OK. Others of them probably had undiagnosed mental issues even before they went. And then there were those who did come back damaged. And when you have guys like that who know how to kill because they've been trained for the service and have a simmering rage, you got a recipe for just disaster. And that's what happened. Um, a couple of things. This is sort of a plug, but I, I do want you to go to Joan's uh, website. And just to make sure it's clear, it's derangedlacrimes.com, correct? That's Yes, that is. And correct. and go there because you're going to get all kinds. There's links to everything. There's links to noir movies yeah. we're going to talk about in the next segment or maybe the third segment, because uh, we both share a love for those uh, noir movies. But also uh, you can get her blog, which is free, where she finds these crazy L.A. crimes. And it's always told with a wink and a nut. There's always <laughs> like. It's not just a, you know, a, a story like you'd see in the newspaper. There's yeah. there's really good writing and kind of, like I said, a wink and a nod to the writing. And it's really fun uh, to go and get on her. I read them all the time and and go <laughs> to her website, uh, derangedlacrimes.com. Um, OK, and I'll just do a plug for me before the break. You can watch the show Sprung. That, there's actually some news coming up about Sprung. Um which, but if you haven't seen it, it's on Freebie, Amazon's free channel, Freebie, and uh, it's really good. So I'm talking to Joan Renner, uh, again, derangedlacrimes.com, and we're going to talk more about a lot of stuff that I just love. I just love this stuff, and I'm sharing it with my audience. Okay, we'll be right back. You're listening to It's Radio with TV's Tim Stack. Want an autograph? Write to MGM. Since when do two bit hoods and hookers give out autographs? Just see me. LAPD, sit down. Who in the hell do you think you are? Uh, take a walk, honey, before I haul your ass downtown. You are making a large mistake. Get away from our table. Shut up. A hooker cut to look like Lana Turner is still a hooker. Hey! She just looks like Lana Turner. She is Lana Turner. 
<laughs> she is Lana Turner. Uh, that's from LA Confidential. One I thought great, I recognized it. Yes, one of the great books and one of the great movies. Um, I want to talk a little bit about because my fascination with the Black Dahlia began with James Elroy. I think a lot of people whose fascination with the Black Dahlia became there, and, and he's just sort of such a mainstay of L.A. noir and crime and just a, an amazing writer. But Joan worked with the guy. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about that. Uh, it was fun. I've known James for a long time. I met him when he was signing the big nowhere, I think back in the, at the end of the eighties, but uh -huh. um, we got back in touch when he, uh, when I was volunteering at the Los Angeles P police museum and we, he and the then director, executive director were friends and they'd always wanted to do this um, project. They'd always wanted to do a book. They'd always wanted to do a black Dahlia exhibit, which they ended up being able to do. But the book, was it's it's LAPD 53. It's really fun. It's great. It's really great. What happened was um, we didn't know exactly how the book was going to go. We knew that James was going to write the narrative and we were going to find the stories and the photographs. And our only criteria was that the photographs should have some sort of um, composition. Most right. of them were taken just they they didn't really have photographers at the time. They were taken by cops themselves. And there, uh, many of them were just surprisingly great. I mean, they're just genius. You they think look like they're themselves. absolutely, let me just interrupt for one second. There's yeah. a, if you're into crime at all, the famous New York crime photographer, Ouija, yeah. you know, they some of these photographs look like he took them, like they were perfectly yeah. composed, as you said. And, and so that's just part of the book. And I interrupted. Keep going. No, no, that's good. No, because that's exactly what we were looking for. We were looking for things with composition. Then we were looking for good stories to go along because we would give James some notes. Then he would do his James thing to them. And there you go. So we started going through photos first just to see what and we had a pile and the pile kept growing. And we realized that the pile that we liked had something in common. Most of the photos were from 1953. Just turned out to be a great year for wacky crime. Even so, better than 47. Even better. So <laughs> what we had then was James Sweet Spot, really, because he he writes a lot about the 50s and 60s. And so this was perfect. So he he was in and he would come into the museum when we were doing the book. He came in, had this, we had the stories, we had the photographs, and he would go down in the basement and just write. And he writes everything. I don't know if you know, but he writes everything out in longhand. Yes, I've been to and, one of his uh, shows. Yeah. He was promoting LA Confidential, and I went, which is, a, we'll talk about that. That's all trip into itself. But he talks about writing everything in longhand. He does. And his writing is just unbelievable. It's abysmal. I mean, it's like hieroglyphics. It's terrible. Yeah. And so he'd be down there and he'd write, 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 write. And I was down there in the basement one morning when he was starting. And I said, I said, James, I'll, I'll go upstairs. I want to bother you. Oh, Johnny, it's okay. It's okay. And so I stayed for a little while and he's writing and he's chuckling at what he's writing. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. So when he comes upstairs later, he sits next to me and I'm at the computer and he's sitting next to me and he has his notes, which he has to read to me because I can't read them. Right. And so uh, we're going through them and he's this. I just the stories are wonderful. It was so much fun to sit there with him and work. He was not he's not accustomed to working with other people. He's a loner. He writes by himself. That's just what he does. And he actually enjoyed the experience. And he's a terrible liar. So I know that he did. And it was great. We had the best time. And one day I, I we were talking about something and he he said that, you know, he always says he listens to nothing but classical music. And he and I are six months apart. I'm, I'm six months younger, which I'll never let him forget. But he, you know, he was, we were talking about something about music and some doo-wop song came up or something and we started singing it together. And I said, see, see, it's not, this is not, this is not Mahler. This is not Beethoven. This is, you know, like street corner doo-wop. Right. And he knew every word. But it was it was the most fun. It was a great experience. I'm going to see him uh, next month. He's in town. He's he's got another book out. And I read so, about this. I in yeah. fact, already pre-ordered it. So uh, yeah. you know what? If if there's a show of any kind, I would love to be on that list. If if you have any sway, he at all. is well. He he's going to do signings around town. He's going to be look at in all the usual places. 
And uh, I think he's going to be out in Pasadena um, at Romans. There's a couple places that he usually hits when he's in town. And he's just, I, I realize for some people he's an acquired taste, but he's in a taste I definitely, he's a taste I've definitely acquired over the years. I, yeah. he's always been just a, 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 a sweetheart to me. And um, I, I really, really like him, really like him a lot. That's, that's good. I do want to, I did want to ask you this because I've been a fan of his from start to finish, like yeah. the book Clandestine, which was his first book. Yes. I love it because I play golf and the protagonist in it is a golfer. <laughs> he's a cop, but he's also a golfer. I just love it all the way through. But he sort of changed his style of writing mm -hmm. with the book White Jazz. It became yeah. this very sort of like I'm putting this in quotes, like Hepcat staccato writing. And I didn't find that as appealing until... I switched over to the book tapes, the audio books. Oh, okay. And this actor named Craig Wasson, who I met years ago when I was a waiter at the Gingerbread, I think. <laughs> and he reads the books and he does a fantastic job reading the books. And so I've just remained an Elroy fan from start to finish. And I can't wait for his new book. I'm, I'll, I'll be ready this fall. So let me ask you, I did want to ask you one more question about Elroy. This is off Elroy, but adjacent which is, is there another writer out there that you like who's on that level of Elroy? Does anybody come to mind? Because I like, there, you know, like, I like Michael Conley. I but, do too. Yeah, but he's not as harsh as he's not as dark and devious. No, no. And in fact, a, a lot of, um, there's some, there might be some writers who write out of Scotland, who write out of, out of the U.S., uh -huh. Who are like that? Um, I'll have to think a bit before any names really come to mind. But I think James, his his voice is uniquely American. It's um, uniquely very hard boiled. It's not for the timid. It's not for the easily offended. No, it's not. And and I think that that now in today's world is a tougher sell for people. So he stands he stands alone in that way just because. Thanks uh because of the times and and i'm glad his voice is still out there i'm glad he's he's writing i'm glad he's still being read he has something to say and people who take it literally are missing the point and you know like we were at a signing one time we were he we were at for lapd 53 and a woman raised her hand in the audience and she said ask james a question and it was about history. And he said, he said, uh, I write fiction, okay, that I write fiction. And she was taking everything he said as history. Like this right. is straight out of- Well, there world. are so many historical characters that are woven in, especially yeah. the JFK trilogy. It's just, it's crazy. And you kind of get the feeling he knows, like he has information that he doesn't share where he gets to, but you just get the feeling like- <laughs> This guy knows something. He knows somebody and he knows the truth. Yeah. And that's what makes him such a good writer is because he 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 heavily researches the stuff. I mean, it's you know, he he gets the notes. He knows the he knows the real stuff. And so that way, when he writes the fictionalized version, he writes it with authority. And if you say something with enough authority, no matter how far fetched it is, people are going to believe that's funny. you. Yes. We know all about that. We watch the news. <laughs> all about that. Um, how are we doing on time, Dr. D? Uh, we got more time? Okay. Um, well, I did want to, and I'll we'll move on from James Elroy, but I did, when I read the my first book that I read of his, and then I just deep dove, was The Big Nowhere, which you mentioned earlier. I love and The Big Nowhere. I'm dropping a name here, but one of my really good friends, uh, which is weird that he was murdered. This is, I don't, mean to put light on it but phil hartman uh was a oh, really oh, dear yes. friend oh, and wildly yes. talented and he was murdered by his wife bryn who was kind of an elroy character what i'm getting yes. is when that book i happened to pick up the book by accident i just love the cover this and it <laughs> looked, the cover looked like this character that phil hartman used to do named chick hazard who was this mm -hmm private eye and it was yes. a piece of the groundlings it was an improvised murder mystery that they did at the ground with chick hazard as the private eye and phil was just unbelievable he's oh, just God. crazy he and i remember as soon as i read it he was on snl at the time and i mailed it to him i just mailed my copy 
to him <laughs> and he did the same thing and we both sort of just after that we just devoured anything <laughs> anything jim's all right but that's enough we gotta there's so many other things to talk about with joan again go to her website which is derangedlacrimes.com, derangedlacrimes.com. You can sign up for the blog there. There are links to all the noir movies, which I want to talk about uh, next. And she's got a book, Crimes of the City, is Deranged Crimes of L.A. Is that going to be the name of your book? We can't, we haven't decided yet. We're, we're kicking something around. It, it's, it could be... Um you know, dark side of the city, Los Angeles during the Prohibition era, something like that. But all the stories contained in the volume uh, take place between 1919 and 1939. And, because and that, that for me is Prohibition in L.A. Prohibition nationally ends in 1933, but in L.A., it doesn't really end until the um, the mayor, Frank Shaw, is recalled in the, in the, in the late 30s. He first really made the city mayor to be recalled. Los Angeles breaks ground no matter what we do. And are, is your name, I can't remember, which I also want to talk about Aggie Underwood coming up. Mm. That we That's something Joan and I started talking about on the bus, yes. and I had never heard of her and then did a deep dive with, with Joan as my mm -hmm. tour guide. And that's as crazy and great an L.A. story as there is, as Aggie one, Underwood. But are you involved with that book at all, The Latest and the Greatest? Um, the first with the latest is the book I wrote. It's yes. a, um, yeah, it is. It's a companion book. I, I curated an exhibit at the L.A. County Public Library, the Central Library, and it was a bunch of photos from Aggie's crime reporting career, cases she covered. And so I wrote the companion book was the first with the latest. And it was just I love Aggie. I find her to be very inspirational. Unbelievable. She was, um, just she was a terrific human being she was fearless as a crime reporter uh she was sometimes credited with solving crimes she said she didn't really do it but she had the same instincts really as any good detective and uh, and was the only female reporter covering the black dahlia am i right well she was the only i think there were other reporters she's the only one only reporter male or female to get a byline gotcha uh, yeah. And is that again going back? I don't. Uh, we'll talk more about Aggie on the other side of this. But I'm at the time a female reporter doing crime was a big deal. It was a huge deal. There were, like I said, there were others. She wasn't alone, but she was probably the best known. Uh, she was. She was a favorite of Walter Winchell, the columnist. He wrote about her. Uh, she was. She knew everyone. She knew judges. She knew gangsters. Right. She knew every single bar in town where her reporters might be drinking. She knew everything. She knew everyone. And she just had a feel for it. And she thought of herself as a general assignment reporter, but she really covered crime with a heart, I think, but also without being her biggest fear was to be a sob sister. She didn't want right. to be you know, so Let, let's let's take another break. I, I want to pick up on on Aggie Underwood on the other side, because I've just, you know, as a writer and as I get older, I tend to like like I love writing comedy. That's what I do. And I what I get paid for. But these crime stories and real life stories and these like I love dramatic stories where people are like, what that happened? Like. Yeah. For a while, I was trying to sell the Moulin, a story about the with a uh, an African American friend of mine, producer about the the Moulin Rouge Hotel in Las Vegas, which which you tell the people the story. It's like it opened in June of '55. It was an insane hit. They closed in October of '55 mm -hmm. because of reasons, you know, the mob and all that. But it's like, what? Wait, who? What? And I feel <laughs> like Aggie Underwood is one of those stories. Like, what? Who, you know, I've never heard of her. It's no. an incredible, fascinating story. Okay, we're going to take a break. I'm talking to Joan Renner. Uh, check out uh, derangedlacrimes.com. You get links to everything there. She's on Twitter. Are you on Instagram? I don't know. I am. Yeah, yes. she's, got, she's on all that stuff. She's really great <laughs> about posting and all that. But again, go to the website. There are links to noir movies and her blog. And, and it's just super entertaining. A great way to spend an afternoon and more is by going to Joan Renner's site. Uh, we're going to take a break. You're listening to It's Radio with TV's Tim Stack.
in number five center marketplace lived a photographer named Arthur Felling who was just beginning to get famous under the name Ouija for his really really vivid vigorous pictures of the New York night crime mayhem fires crashes yeah okay Ouija we, we mentioned him earlier and yeah. talking to Joan Renner uh please check out her website derangedlacrimes.com she's got links to books there that she's written she's got a new book coming out in the fall which we don't have a title yet but we will Eventually. Uh, <laughs> um but uh, i mentioned ouija earlier because part of what you know i just i just love it i love the whole post-war noir thing mm -hmm. and i want to talk a little bit about noir movies but we were talking about aggie underwood and 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 what I remember from all the deep diving, because I actually tried to with Joan tried to talk to some people about doing this as a TV series, which yeah. I still think is a great idea. It's, it's a still wonderful hard to idea. sell anything period piece. It's hard to sell anything that isn't had doesn't have a star attached. Although this part would be an incredible part for the right actor. Oh. Um, so anyway, tell us a little bit about her, how she got started and where she ended. Uh, well, Aggie Underwood was uh, was born in San Francisco. She ended up, her, her mother died when she was five or six. She ended up being farmed out to relatives because her father was, you don't hear this anymore, her father was a glass blower. That's a trade that doesn't really happen too much anymore. Um, she ended up shifting around. She finally wound up with some relative in Los Angeles. The relative tried to stick a bow in her hair and take her around studios to, you know, turn her into a child actress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aggie wanted nothing to do with it. She was like, she has, she's like, I have no talent for this. This is terrible. So what she ended up doing was um, the relative was going to turn Aggie in because Aggie had a job. She was working at the um, Pig and Whistle. And which is still was, around, right? Yeah, the one she was working in downtown. There was a pig and whistle downtown, I think. She, they, her relative was going to turn her in because she was underage, and she said, "If you don't give me part of your paycheck, I'm turning, I'm dropping a dime on you." Let me just interrupt for one second because my parent, my father, had a sim, not a similar thing, but back during the depression, like my grandmother needed to be divorced in order to get a job as a teacher, and part of Aggie's that you know the depression was so pervasive in people's life. Can you imagine turning because she had a job but was a minor, she could get turned in for doing something wrong? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was supposed to pay off the relative, but she was, but she knew the the guy that was the soda jerk there, and his last name was Underwood. So you can kind of guess how this goes. He said, Well, she can't do that. And Aggie said, Well, yeah, she can. You know, I am underage, and yeah, she can. And he said, Well, she can't do that if you're married. And so on a whim, they got married and it, it actually, so they're married for a while that she's still, she's still very, very young. They have two kids and uh, her sister who she had, they'd lost touch because of the, you know, the family situation, the sister came out to live with them. And so that everybody's trying to, Aggie's staying at home, the sister and her husband are out working every day. And Aggie wanted a pair of silk stockings. This is like 1926 or something. Again, the Depression. My dad told us well, to be not be able to have a, a just a different time. We don't even yeah. think about what people needed to do in order to survive. Oh, it's it's amazing. And she just she just wanted she longed for a pair of silk stockings because she was getting her sister's hand me downs, which you know had runs in them, and uh because she wore them out at work. And Aggie said, and Aggie's husband said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, hon. We, we can't, we really cannot, we cannot afford this. And she just got all, you know, full of herself and blustering. All right, then I'm going to get a job and buy my own stockings. Well, she had no idea. She hadn't worked outside the home for a few years. Just then, like it was just made, her best friend called her and she said, hey, Aggie, how'd you like to make some money for the holidays? And Aggie's like, oh, okay, doing what? And she said, well, I work at a newspaper, The Record, downtown. We need someone to work the switchboard. You and I used to be switchboard operators together, so I know you can do it. Why don't you come down? She did. She ends up in the, in the newsroom. She's watching everything. It was, she said it was just 
amazing. It was riveting, you know. Yeah. yeah. She just it was just, she was mystified. And in December of 1927, this is the holiday season for her when she's working there, a big story broke. It was the kidnapping of Marion Parker. This is a 12-year-old girl who was kidnapped and ultimately uh she was mutilated, murdered. And Aggie was like everyone in everywhere was fascinated with the story. Aggie said, I committed the unpardonable sin of looking over the shoulders of reporters as they're getting this new this stuff off the wire and they're writing right. the stories. And she said, she said she knew, but she just couldn't help herself. And and the editor said, Aggie, if you know, if if this if <laughs> if this means so much to you, why don't you become a reporter? So she knew right then that was it. That's what she wanted to do. That's all she wanted to do. And she got the usual, you know, girl stories at first. She covered fashion, but then she started covering all kinds of stuff. She wanted to get some tickets for a, a fight, a boxing match for her husband. And the editor said, Well. I can get you the tickets, but you got to write about the match. Allie, you know, Aggie didn't know anything about boxing, but she learned. And so she could write sports stuff. She could write fashion. And then she gets into the crime and then she just finds her way. And, and really, uh, again, sort of made her mark on the Black Dahlia. Am I right? That you are absolutely she's working right. for a Hearst paper. And of course, what, uh, you know, the Black Dahlia story took off nationally internationally yes. why was that such an a mind-blowing story at the time i think in part just because uh elizabeth short was a pretty girl she's 22 right. years old she's found uh she's found without any identification completely naked in a vacant lot in Lamert park um she's cut in half it was a gruesome crime it was a frightening it was a terrifying crime and People just mythologized her. Right. And and just kept everything, getting... you, everything you hear about her now, almost everything you read about her now is not true. Anytime you read an article and it starts with actress wannabe, Hollywood wannabe, you know it's you know it's nonsense. Just throw it in the trash. Right. I will say that again, we're back to the Black Dahlia tour. And there have been so many, you know, I did it, my dad did it, you know, oh. uh, you know, all of these things. But I'm not gonna give it away how it ends. <laughs> But the tour does solve the murder. They do. I, I think you present a very realistic idea of what probably happened. Yeah. And that's what another reason is to go on the tour is you get you get the ending. You find out what it is. Um, well, it's, a, it's a friend's solution. He is writing the book. Fingers crossed. But yeah, I mean, there's so much. Again, it's a myth and people take it very seriously. You cannot. I had a woman contact me and she said she knew who killed Elizabeth Short. And I said, OK, let, let's hear what you got. And she said it was a conspiracy between the Masons and the Illuminati. There you go. And I said, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to burst your bubble. I said, well, that sounds very interesting. I don't personally subscribe to that theory, but if you find out any more on it, please contact me again. But I hear stuff like that. I get people who contact me all the time. And there's always a detective, LAPD detective assigned to the case. It's been the same woman now for a few years, I think. And she gets calls. She still gets calls every month about the case. And she often asks them right out of the gate, when were you born? Right. <laughs> so their information is generally, I have a theory, you know. Yeah. But I will say that uh, we broadcast here from Santa Barbara, California, and Santa Barbara plays a part of the Black Dahlia because yeah. it's the only place where she, they got the fingerprints of the body. They connected it to Best Short being in Santa Barbara. They did. She was arrested for um, being in a restaurant. She wasn't drinking. She never really drank, but she was with some older people from Camp Cook. And because she was the camp cook cutie and she was out with some people older than she and they were drinking and she was arrested being underage, you know, with alcohol. And uh -huh. that's how the, that famous mug shot ended up. So but that's all in Santa Barbara. But it's it really is sort of a. I mean, when I there have been so many big crimes since then. Yeah. And, and I feel like I guess the Lindbergh baby before this became, you know, there have there's a whole history of like crazy media driven crimes and oh, without a doubt time, the black dahlia was certainly the one and it's just continued to live on 
And I think part of it's because of what you do and James Elroy and this tour and just there have been so many movies, not particularly good ones. No, <laughs> sad to say. Mostly stuff. not. Uh, when they turned the Elroy book into one, um, you know, there would be a great movie. And it just, it just. He won. hates it. Oh, I'm sure. But I <laughs> hate LA Confidential too. Yeah, he does. He doesn't like that one either, which I think he's wrong, but it's yes. his book. He gets to be. He gets to say whatever he wants. You know, it's funny. You were talking about him working solo and he he's never really done great in television. There have been things along the way. A yeah. friend of mine had a project with him. And part of the thing about writing TV is you're in a room with other writers. And yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> and, you know, you got to be aware of other people. You can be the person in charge, but you've got other people there and you want to solicit. No, he doesn't play well with others. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, so well, let's talk quickly. I'm, you met him at the L.A. Police Museum. Yeah, we got we reconnected there and after you years work at the L.A. County Sheriff's Museum, too. Yes. Now I do. Um, my friend. Glenn Martin, who's retired LAPD, he is now executive director of the LA Police Memorial Foundation, which is the Widows and Orphans Fund. So he doesn't work at the museum anymore. When he left about seven years ago, so did I. And our mutual friend, Michael Friend and Tony, became the curator of the Sheriff's Museum, which doesn't really have a home yet. But he said, Joan, you wanna come over here and work with me? And I said, I thought you'd never ask. So I've been there since and working on projects with him. And it's through him that I I've been able to um, meet and make friends with some amazing Sheriff's Homicide Bureau detectives, uh -huh. uh, some retired detectives. I go to their, they have a lunch every month and I try to go, this is my my bulldog necklace. I'm an official bulldog. That's their, um, their mascot is the bulldog. Bulldog. And uh, I'm an official bulldog. And so I try to go to the lunch. And it was really funny. The first time I went with Mike, you know, they give you they, because they're always super polite. They're so nice. But they give you the, the they give you the cop stink eye because they don't know who you are. You right. know, Mike vouched for me. So that's a step in the right direction. But they're going to make up their own minds. To are see there other I'm, women there, too? Not usually. Um, Sometimes there are women from the crime lab and occasionally a female homicide uh -huh. a detective but sometimes i'm the only female just because that's the way it is it's a boys club but um they you know as they got to know me over the months then uh, you know then they felt more comfortable and so one day we're talking about a horrendous crime it was just awful and i made a comment and oh boy they came on me like oh unbelievable and it was great because you know you have to be able to take a joke at your own expense right so I, you know, when we left, Mike said, are you okay? And I said, about what? And he said, well, they really mess with you. And I said, that's how I know they love me. I realized that that was the moment I broke through. And from then on, I was an official bulldog and they, they, they gifted me an official bulldog pin. Mike said, I don't even have one of those. And I said, well, they like me better than they like you. But um, they gave me a, you know, a purse and they're just, I love these guys. So I've met people like Gil Carrillo, who was a principal investigator on the Night Stalker case. Wow. Um, Frank Salerno. If you saw the series, if yes. you saw the series about them, oh, yes. they are phenomenal human beings. They each have a different style, but they are unbelievable detectives and the wow. nicest people. I hope that movie gets made someday from the documentary's point of view, because I had completely forgotten there's a reporter. Now she's a realtor, Laurel Erickson, who was the KNBC reporter who would arrive at scenes, crime scenes before the cops got there because she had gotten a tip from somebody on LAPD on the Night Stalker. It's really an amazing story, but it's I would love to see story. it from the cops and the media story. And you get a glimpse of that in the documentary. So you do. Yeah. Um, but I'm very lucky for, for that. You know, well, go visit those two websites, the LA County police museum website, and you can go there. That's an actual building. Yeah, You can actually go there. It's in an old, it's in the only extant um, police LAPD building from the twenties. That's the only one that still remains. Um, Sheriff's museum where I am now, I work out of the Hall of Justice. We where we are is in the basement, and where we are is where the where the morgue was. So I basically work at a table where, like, adjacent to where they uh, autopsied Robert Kennedy, 
Wow. Um, Marilyn Monroe, right. um, Ben Siegel, you name it, they were there. We had a visitor last couple of years ago, and it was the coroner to the stars, none other than coroner Thomas Noguchi. Sure. And he he showed up very quiet. I didn't even realize he was still alive until he showed up, but um, very soft spoken, nice man. And he had a lot of good memories there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He's he was just he pointed out over here is where we cut open Marilyn Monroe. Oh my. And I'm like, okay and over here was rfk and it was just an unbelievable tour as you know through his experience okay we got to take one more break i'm talking to joan renner go to her website derangedlacrimes.com there are links to her all the world she lives in and it's just <laughs> really fun uh you know this is a diversion for us today on this show it's a really fun diversion so it's great to have her uh you're listening to it's radio with tv's tim stack we'll be right back okay we have eight minutes okay uh, we're at uh, yeah um uh, anyway let's uh, okay go ahead and roll this here and i'll just keep you at cue all right i'm gonna head out okay have fun what are you gonna do I don't know, just finish up work and relax. Okay, well, don't miss me too much. I won't. All right, bye. All right, bye. Finally, he's gone. I have the whole night to unwind. And do a little self-care. The only way I know how. I'm gonna watch a murder show, murder show. I'm gonna watch a murder show, Netflix show time, HBO and Dayline. Murder show, murder show. I'm gonna watch a murder show, YouTube, Hulu. That's my favorite thing to do. Okay, that was murder show, the bit from SNL. Uh, I guess Joan Renner, Renner has been a I think Joan Rivers. Joan Renner has been a guest on a lot of those ID channel shows. What's yep. the craziest one you ever did? Oh gosh, uh, that's difficult to say, really. Um, I've yeah. done so many. I don't I want to throw that. anyone under the bus. I I've done, but I've I've done some. I try never to do. I, I I always tell them up front. I will not lie. I will not give a point of view that's not my own. You know. So if if you are telling me this is unscripted, it's unscripted. This is me talking. Do you do a lot of like they'll give you the case? Do you will do a lot of research before you go on? They usually what they do is um, it varies from place to place, but basically they give me a brief. They'll give me the case because I don't know all of them. Some of them are out of my purview. Right. Um, I always do a little bit of my own research. One case they gave me, I, this was for Evil Twins. <laughs> and I love uh, Evil it, Twins, that show. Evil Twins is the best. Who knew there were so many killer twins? But <laughs> That's there, exactly. it was two guys, <laughs> two guys who actually were, um, they committed, they were probably two of the first people convicted on, uh, on date rape drug on rohypnol and they were in the south bay area they raped and they didn't murder anybody but they raped and videoed their victims oh. and they were just disgusting human beings they both went to prison they were supposed to go for a very long time so but i looked up some stuff on the case myself i looked them up on the sex offender registry i looked them up to see if they were still in prison one of them was one of them was out the one that was out was not a registered he wasn't registered and i thought well why not you have to be I couldn't find him, couldn't find him. I hear from a reader of my blog in Canada that he's in Canada. This sounds like a setup for your own mystery. Like I, know. I didn't know that he had moved. The reason he was in Canada is because California quietly released him and sent him back where he was a citizen. They made him Canada's problem. Now, both brothers are there. They've reoffended, not rapes, but they've re well, one might have assaulted, but they they've reoffended just as I knew they would. And I told the um, producer of the show at the time, I said, look, these guys, one of them is in the wind. No one seems to know where he is. This is before I knew he was in Canada. And, you know, but then I got this email and it was from a, uh, another from a reader. And he said, you're all wrong about these brothers. I've known them their whole lives. They're good really good guys. You know, they couldn't have done this. So I look at his IP, it's, I look at his IP address. Gee, I wonder where in Canada this came from. It was one of the brothers, of course. So I email him back and I say, look. Really? Yeah, oh yeah. 
I say, look, I know that there's only two people on the planet who have that many nice things to say about you guys. And it's either one of you. I don't know which one you are. You're twins. I couldn't tell the difference if you were sitting in front of me. But if you ever, you know, get enough chutzpah to have a real conversation about this, contact me again. Oh, it's, I'd be so it's afraid. Been it's been, no, he's in Canada. It's been crickets. You know, it's been crickets. And I thought, you moron. And I've heard from the victims. And this is why I do what I do. All, all seriousness. I do this. I've heard from victims of these two guys. Okay. And um, the first they heard that they were released was reading my blog. They were supposed to be contacted by the state of California and they were not. And so um, I've been in contact with a couple of the victims and I try always if they if they need help to point them in that direction or not. And I find that that's it. Cause I don't wanna be one of those true crime people who just exploit a person's pain for my own whatever. Right, you know? that's, and, that's uh, a really I, great point and good for I you. I can't do that, I can't no. do that. So I have to give back. So if there's, this is the way I can do it. I've, I've helped people, I've talked to victims of crimes and uh, it's just, it's just the the best thing that I can do. Yeah. So. Well, good for you, and thank you, and thank you for. Ugh, we ran out of time. I wanted to. Oh, get, no. I wanted to get to noir movies. You told me you're out of the past is your favorite noir movie. I love Out of the Past. I can watch that over and over again. But I like all noir films where the where the woman is particularly awful because it's just a nice juxtaposition between yeah. like like the one like the. The, the 50s, 40s and 50s housewife with the pearls, you know, and the femme fatale who is just, you know, hooking these guys and dragging them to their doom. Uh, my favorite is, which is completely different, is a Sam Fuller film, Pick Up on South Street with Richard, Ooh. who Ooh. used to live in Santa Barbara. And uh, I just love that. I do notice that the L.A. noir films, there's an element of sex to them that yeah. doesn't exist in the New York. New York is just straight on crime it's cop films crime. yeah films like naked city it's just it's almost like a documentary it's just uh, crime but there's a sexiness to the la anyway well, we had run out of time joan renner thank so you so sad. much for doing this it was great to see you again good to see you too thank you so I, much for having me see you at one of the elroy events because i have pre-ordered the book and and Yay. i went to another event of his where he brought a lounge band in and sang uh, uh, <laughs> anyway thank it's you wonderful go to joan's uh, website that will give you links to everything deranged la crimes.com i promise you a fun afternoon deep diving off that thing uh joan thank you again and uh join me next time on it's radio with tv's tim stack